afternoon or good morning, everyone, and welcome to this data talks. Today we are joined by Julia Reinhardt, who is an international strategy consultant for tech and policy, and currently also a fellow at the Mozilla Foundation. Today we will talk about um, EU regulations, uh, like uh, the General Data uh, Regulation Protection (GDPR), uh, and discuss EU regulatory uh, activity, but then from a US perspective. Uh, Esther Hoyer will uh, lead today's discussion um, and uh, we will record the session, put it on YouTube afterwards and promote it on our channels. So stay tuned for that. If nothing else, I would like to give the floor to you, Esther and Julia. Great. Thank you, Ray. And uh, welcome to you, Julia. I'm very happy to welcome you today to our data talks on behalf of the Support Center for Data Sharing and the European Data Portal. At the Support Center for Data Sharing, we look at how to share data in an ethical way, in a legally compliant way, a technical feasible way and a viable way. And um, at the European Data Portal, we make the open data from European countries and institutions available, support the countries and institutions with publishing this data and also help the community of reusers to understand and leverage the potential of open data. Today, uh, we are of course also going to talk about data, about data policy beyond Europe today for a change. So I'm very excited um, to hear more about um, what Julia, you can tell us today. Um, how did it happen that you are involved in the field of data strategy and data regulation between EU and the US? Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Well, so I am a fellow with the, in residence with the Mozilla Foundation um, and uh, also a privacy professional. And I came to the US uh, nine years ago as a, a German diplomat. I was in diplomacy for almost 15 years for Germany. And um, so when I worked in, in San Francisco, of course, my main, um, my main task was to um, cover relations to tech companies. And um, so this is, um, this is what you do here, which is really uh, very exciting because many of those uh, tech companies have a power and economic power and al almost like a political and societal uh, power that is comparable to some nation states. So uh, right now I wear two hats. Um, my work with the Mozilla Foundation focuses on the regulation of artificial intelligence and how upcoming proposals from Europe will affect US companies, especially here in Silicon Valley. And um, as a certified privacy professional, um, that's my other head. I help US companies comply with European regulation, especially with uh, the general data protection regulation that Ray mentioned and other related policy in the uh, in the data protection field. Great. And can you maybe explain to us why is European regulation important to the US? To the US? What is the impact? Well, uh, so in the case, uh, of course, I mean, these are two very important economic blocks and uh, and the, um, the trade among them is 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 essential. It's so it's so big that, of course, anything the other side does in terms of rules uh, um, is is relevant for the other side. But in the case of um, GDPR, um, it's even more um, GDPR. It applies to companies located in, in Europe, and that is something that we've always had, of course, uh, also with the with the directive, the data protection directive that was in place before GDPR. But GDPR also protects all personal data of European residents, no matter where it is handled in Europe or outside of Europe in the rest of the world. So that means that uh, US companies, uh, even those without any presence in Europe, have an obligation to protect this personal data when they have users from Europe because it belongs to those uh, residents. And that means that we as uh, privacy professionals have to make sure that the companies here in the US um, and all over the world understand what processes need to be involved and what they have to commit to. Um, and so they have to be informed what uh, what data protection laws exist in other places of the world, because most of these, I mean, the big companies here have users all over the world. Um, and um, many of the smaller ones also uh, launch on European on the European market. So when uh, GDPR became enforceable in 2018, um, I could witness disbelief, resistance in Silicon Valley. Um, some companies banned European users from their services out of uh, fear they could get in trouble for non-compliance. 
And um, but many U.S. based companies um, that process personal data of people around the world have then uh, decided uh, once they got into what the data management um, um, requires to apply GDPR and extend all the rights that go with it to their customers who are not European residents, but uh, who live outside of Europe. And that is, of course, um, really relevant. Um, because if, to those companies, it gives them an aid edge in global compliance. It's easier for them in terms of handling complaints and requests because it's just really difficult in some, on some platforms, for example, to distinguish the locations of uh, users. And so they just say that we just give our, all of our customers all the rights that Europeans have, which is, of course, in this case, a very high bar. And it's still easier for the organization then to sort out the customer's location and um, attribute different rights according to their location. And so um, GDPR kind of offers them a legal framework, a set of standard that is, um, I mean, at least compared to other uh, leg legislation around the world that is less spelled out or doesn't exist at all, uh, relatively clearly adoptable. And of course, that was also a big plus for, for us in the field because uh, we do have uh, privacy laws uh, in the US. We also have, um, so on a federal level, there are sectoral ones um, in the healthcare sector for children and some other uh, sectoral privacy laws and, um, and they re need to be uh, implemented, of course. But then also we have privacy laws on state level uh, increasingly. Um, first of all, here in California, but um, but then also growing um, increasingly in other states. And so GDPR is a bit, uh, it's, it's not perfect. It's also not always easy to um, implement, but it's a bit clearer than many of those um, other privacy laws that companies have to adopt here. So it gives them, um, they appreciate that there's a standard now, now that is law in one part of the world, but can serve as a guideline also for other parts of the world. And even if this guideline is more demanding than legislation in their markets outside of Europe, it makes life easier for them to have one high profile standard than many different ones, because really this growing globally, a global privacy patchwork, uh, as I call it, um, mm -hmm. is really hard to handle. Yeah, so the sentiment from, from disbelief changed a little bit to some appreciation towards the legal framework. Yes. Not yeah. everywhere, but I did my best also, of course, to to convince companies that um, lean data management uh, makes life easier, um, especially when you're a small company, because when you start collecting data, of course, you still have a better grasp on what you collect and and in which way you handle and store it uh, with, uh, you know, which processes and, and, and rules. So it's much easier for a company to do that early on. And that's yeah. what I always try to tell them. Understood. So you just touched upon it when you said small companies. Is Are these topics relevant for the big and the small companies both? Is it, is it more challenging for one of them? How do you see that? Well, um, it's uh, hard to generalize. So my clients are mainly small and medium sized uh, companies based in the US with only some clients in Europe or sometimes only with the mere intention of soon expanding to Europe. But this privacy management strategy that I talked about has been found with bigger tech firms as well. I mean, the very big ones, uh, of course, um, they have big legal teams and they have also offices in Brussels. And so they were involved in the lobbying process in the EU, EU for years. So they knew well in advance what's coming up, uh, how to prepare for it, but also how, uh, were influencing, of course, in this, in this very long negotiation process that uh, GDPR um, uh, had. And um, so uh, it's also true that compliance, because it in involves time and money, is sometimes harder for small companies. But um, as I said, so it's hard to generalize. There are those small ones that benefited from GDPR because they set uh, particularly on this path to privacy by design and they created products that are more privacy proof on purpose and made this their brand and their their marketing asset. Um, and then those um, that build privacy management software, for example, I mean, they benefited big time. They're growing like crazy and that's really great because it makes uh, uh, compliance much easier, although it's sometimes uh, a bit 
uh, too easy or, you know, but the, the software helps a lot, of course, and those uh, those companies, of course, have grown. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, small companies also tend to have less, less data, which makes it easier and less, less costly to change um, and improve their data, data management, of course. So, but overall, I have to say that a lot of small ones have uh, lost vendor contracts, uh, which means that bigger companies would not contract with them anymore. For example, that for software that is integrated into the bigger company software, because they could not guarantee GDPR compliance at the same level and at the same speed. Um, uh, and um, and uh, under GDPR, that's a liability problem also for the contract partner. So yes, that's a worry that's been expressed quite often, uh, not only in Europe, but also here. And some of it is true for sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And we now talked a lot about GDPR and that's uh, definitely worth it. Um, beyond GDPR, there are a lot of the, the regulation future is quite rich um, and there are more regulations that are tech relevant. Um, what do you see coming or what are other regulations um, that you talk about with your clients and with your network? Yeah, so first of all, GDPR is still a topic, uh, of course, not that craziness of early 2018 anymore. So when I can get involved now to work on GDPR compliance, it's mostly for companies that only now look to Europe as a potential market to launch because maybe they didn't even exist, exist in 2018 or they were still too small. And when they start uh, building up, for example, a partnership with a European company or set up, need to set up their GDPR uh, compliant vendor agreements for that. Uh, so that's uh, a big field still. Plus, now that the um, uh, European Court of Justice has invalidated the data transfer uh, framework between the EU, EU and the US um, that many small companies relied on so far, uh, this has given us a whole new challenge to work on and that is making yeah. sure um, uh, that, that those data transfers are still um, uh, can still be done in a way that is compliant with European law. So mm -hmm. yeah, that we still we still do that and it's uh, it's a lot. But um, the Commission has tabled two other proposals last December, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. And I believe both will have, have quite yeah in the US in a different way from GDPR, um, more likely uh, just giving inspiration and a set of tools to test like in a sandbox. Um, because uh, US lawmakers are thinking about the same issues um, and they're trying to see what could work. We have a new administration here that is much more open to, to all these um, um, topics and um, with Europe going ahead with uh, strong regulation on, on uh, platforms, gatekeepers, um, content moderation, um, US lawmakers definitely look and see what could work and what they could adapt as well, because there's quite some readiness, as I said, to go in that, maybe not that same direction, but um, just seeing what tools could work. And that is something that, for example, when you listen to Senator Amy Klobuchar and her antitrust plans, I, uh, she, she openly says that she's very uh, much inspired by what happens in the EU and is in regular contact with, uh, with Margrethe Vestager. And so that's pretty interesting to see, which I mean, just the, the last four years under President Trump um, was not no, no, noticeable. Um, and um, well, what I'm mostly working on these days is the upcoming regulatory proposal that the Commission will table next month uh, around trustworthy art artificial intelligence. And uh, that's a draft policy that is expected to be tabled uh, to member states for negotiation. And that could, I mean, we, know, we don't know how long these negotiations will last, uh, but once they are successful, this could be the world's first um, re general regulation on AI. So. I find that pretty exciting because um, although I mean there's a lot to say about whether the proposed regulation will be enough or will it work, but um, you know in AI policy the big focus of the past years was principles and we've seen important work done by the OECD in particular but also UNESCO and other international bodies um, and um, 
and of course many national governments, everybody says uh, that uh, something has to be done and fast because uh, the technology is just advancing so fast. But um, now in 2021, I think we're at the stage of how do you transform these principles into practical rules and and regulations. Um, yeah, so that's um, yeah. that's what I'm mostly working on. Yeah, very exciting. And what would be in this regulation, what would you hope um, it addresses? If you would wish for one or two points that have to be in there. Yeah, so um, well, first of all, um, there's an important point uh, to to make and that regulation will um, will most likely also mention that and that is that um, existing laws already cover AI, but they have to be adapted. So, uh, you know, there's um, there's laws in, in consumer protection on non-discrimination, data protection, of course, product safety, liability, and they apply to AI systems just the same. Consumers expect the same level of safety and respect of their rights, whether or not a product or system relies on AI. But um, the these aspects that uh, apply to AI um, are hard to implement and it's not very clear um, how how they can actually be enforced when you have a system that is you know pretty opaque, unpredictable, complex and well above all autonomous in many cases or until a certain point. And so it's really important that lawmakers look at how to amend and update those laws so they they very clearly cover AI as well and so that we consumers, can don't have to care about whether a product contains a bit of AI or a lot mm -hmm. where uh, that we just mm -hmm. expect the same uh, protection. Um, but of course, um, beyond that, um, I'm I'm pretty excited about the fact that so far, you know, most governments also in the US uh, on state and local level have, shy, have shied away from doing the actual work on a comprehensive and rights based approach in AI. And, um, you know, just to have like a checklist, um, like an in the US, you would call it an FDA approval list. Uh, you know, we have this uh, the, the drugs administration here uh, that approves uh, vaccines or, um, mm -hmm. or medication and something like that for AI um, would be would be, I think, the right thing to do, uh, you know, to to require human oversight. Um, uh, to require accuracy and robustness, uh, resilience against uh, attacks and manipulation, so the safety aspect. Um, also to uh, to make sure that train uh, that training data sets are representative and comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, that is a big uh, point uh, against bias uh, as much as possible, mm -hmm. and uh, that they comply with uh, data protection rules. Also, you know this aspect that is in some. Uh, smaller um, actually uh, state laws here, but never on a on a higher level that users need to be informed when they interact with an AI system and not a human so that they know mm -hmm. what the capabilities and limitations are, uh, are of, you know, the voice that is speaking to them or uh, that's a that's an important application and um, uh, for me as a, a privacy professional, of course, uh, it's always super important to remind companies that data and record keeping is very important and that is also in the case of AI important so they can trace back uh, AI decisions in case there's a mm -hmm. there's a harm or there's a complaint uh, and so they can trace back why um, why the system decided this way. And honestly, for me, I mean, it's not clear whether the Commission will will propose that, but um, I wish for some um, tougher um, stance on facial recognition. Um, the Commission will probably say, uh, yeah, it has to uh, comply with data protection rules and um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, and there are already quite important safeguards in there, but um, I would want to see more. And then also, I mean, I have to also say, I, I didn't mention that yet, um, all these requirements, um, the EU, the, the Commission um, foresees them only for high risk applications of AI and what that is, uh, is a whole different story. I think that the way they want to define uh, high risk 
is uh, not clear enough and doesn't cover enough uh, because what it's highly subjective what a high risk is for some um, for some people a high risk a, a low risk uh, that perceived by others could actually be high risk for them or yeah. Um, also, you know, individual risks um, is something completely different from uh, collective risk. And so in that sense, you know, what I'm what I'm seeing uh, there um, uh, is, is not ideal. Um, but um, what is um, what is important uh, with it is that it will have a ripple effect on other regions of the world again. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that is the aspect that I find uh, exciting and not. Um, it is a very European approach. It doesn't necessarily need to be right for evil, uh, every legal culture, but uh, I'm a pragmatic. And so um, probably as a lesson, a lesson learned from GDPR, uh, I know that this would be a groundwork for a more intense uh, public debate on how to regulate AI. And in mm -hmm. that way, um, you know, a first real life attempt at getting it right at quite a big scale because I mean the <laughs> European Union is 27 countries, 450 million residents and um, I'm sure that this will push other regions to find their own answers to this question about the policies we need for AI. Mm -hmm. Thank you and I like how you said that there are already laws in place and that in a way consumers or users should know that the same laws apply no matter if they use AI or not. And um, my question for you is humans are allowed to learn and use their learnings in the next situation. So I can learn from today and use my, my knowledge uh, in, in, in my tomorrow tomorrow's conversation. Do algorithms have the same freedom to take learnings or uh, do you see a risk there of Comp uh, of confidentiality, personal data? Well, that depends on how they are built. Um, the exciting thing about AI is that it can um, that it can take um, uh, experience and uh, mistakes it made and and improve and improve and improve even more. Uh, so in a way, it's kind of uh, like a, in, in some cases, depending on the application case, but I, I, I like to compare it to a to a small child doing one thing over and over again and then you know you learn from your mistakes and you become better and better but depending on uh, what you see and what is shown to you uh, of course uh, this creates um, sometimes kind of a distorted uh, view of reality or what is wrong and mm -hmm. what is uh, <laughs> right um, yeah. kind of like you know how children grow up in different circumstances and um, I think it's uh, there's a very high responsibility for engineers uh, here, and uh, I do assume that most, uh, you know, build uh, algorithms in, with the best intent uh, and try to make them as good as possible. But of course, um, there's um, there's this problem about bias, of course, that is you know mm -hmm. unconscious and. Um, uh, sometimes also companies, uh, engineering teams don't put enough uh, care into selecting their uh, training data set. Um, mm -hmm. Then, yeah, and of course, you know, the I think it's important to always limit, um, not necessarily make the uh, application cases small, but just to, uh, you need to define and beforehand what you want to achieve. And then, um, and then you also have realistic goals of what AI can do for you in a certain application case. I think a lot of people also use this term very broadly and don't really mm -hmm. um, have a clear understanding of what AI can do and what it can't. It mm -hmm. does serve as an additional thinking capacity for humans. In many cases, that is super uh, useful. I, mm -hmm. I have high expectations for AI to help us in, uh, you know, uh, mitigating the climate uh, crisis, mm -hmm. um, in making transportation more, um, more, um, uh, uh, well, um, eff effectful. So um, effective. So um, using less fuel, um, making agriculture, um, you know, the use of, of. Mm -hmm. uh, 
of fertilizers, uh, much more targeted. Uh, mm -hmm. All these things uh, AI can do and we need it as soon as possible. Um, but um, I think these are applications where this checklist or approval process, if how I imagine it, uh, should be very fast. But uh, then in other cases where um, human rights are involved, um, we should be very cautious and, and limit um, the cases first to see how they go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, like a child, right? I, I really like this analogy. A child sometimes is biased uh, and sometimes a child doesn't know which part of a conversation maybe not to share with the neighbors the next day and which part, which learning is very fine to, to use <laughs> in a different setting. So I like this analogy. And um, you talked about um, human rights and um, maybe a bit of a gap, but I saw that you're also supporting uh, Food Watch and you're active in this field. Is this kind of a personal passion or is that linked to your to your job? Well, um, it's not linked to my job because I started uh, being interested in uh, in slow food, in the slow food movement um, and, um, you know, uh, caring about uh, healthy food and especially uh, up the food chain, um, healthy agriculture much earlier than this, actually from uh, when I lived in in Rome um, in 2005 to 2008. So um, that was before getting, slightly before getting into tech policy, but maybe there is a link. It's interesting that you're saying that because, um, um, so I think there are uh, there are quite a number of challenges that uh, that we're facing uh, right now, and um, I do like to work on things that matter. I didn't, don't mm -hmm. need to tackle the the biggest obstacles and the biggest challenges all at once. Uh, and um, I do think that the climate crisis is the biggest challenge uh, to us humans. My my strengths and uh, skills. Um, apply best to the other uh, crisis I see, and that is regulating technology in a way that serves uh, human um, uh, human beings and human society, um, because we are we're in the process of getting overwhelmed with what we can do, uh, and we should really. I'm not against that. As I said, we need some of that really fast, and it's 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 fantastic. But we also need to see where we apply it and where we don't apply it. And I think um, so. The slow food movement, um, in its origins in in northern Italy, it was really about um, going back to the roots of what local what can do and where uh, global is harmful, and also um, working on diversity. So mm -hmm. um, uh, supporting uh, local food, but also local um, species of, you know, certain pigs or certain plants uh, mm -hmm. that, yeah. you know, are actually represented in the local um, cuisine. And um, and in that sense, there's another, another uh, parallel. It's interesting that you that you're talking about this because um, working with small and medium uh, companies and in the field of AI policy, um, what strikes me most is that in, in AI, size clearly matters. Um, the size of the company clearly matters. The size of the training data set um, uh, um, clearly matters. And the more data you can gather, the better your AI system works. And so um, this experience with GDPR, um, uh, you know, uh, doing harm to the small players because they um, uh, they couldn't face the compliance costs. Uh, um, regulation blocked them more than big ones in the beginning. Um, uh, it has it has this risk, and I mean it's already there. It's not just a future risk. We are seeing it um, that uh, we're going to have monopolies um, in 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 this field where just the very few big companies gather so much data from their uh, AI systems that they're just going to crush the others uh, if there are no, no, um, no rules in place. And um, in the field of AI, this happens even faster than in the rest of technology uh, industry. And so um, these monopolies, I mean, they 
they have the the capacity to create better uh, AI systems that serve people better, that they probably like better in you know the way they work. But um, also, um, we need competition, and um, mm -hmm. we need uh, competition not only. Uh, for innovation, which already is a very important point, but also uh, because the power of those uh, monopolies becomes almost unlimited when there are few players in the market. Yeah, and I think that's a global question. Um, how, if we say this is a global question that Europe and the US is jointly talking about, um, what goes wrong sometimes in these conversations, assuming that something can go wrong? Is it maybe miscommunication, different terminologies, different values? What's your experience? Well, I mean, first of all, we're talking about differences, but honestly, looking at the rest of the world, um, you know, Asia, um, uh, uh, talking about Asia first, because they're so strong in, in uh, technology development, we have to say that the US and Europe have a lot in common. And uh, that is mainly their political systems. And we can talk about differences um, uh, a lot, but uh, this um, the belief in the rule of law, the belief in human rights, uh, the belief uh, um, in uh, fundamental human rights. Um, and, um, and then also, you know, just our democratic systems uh, and the market economy. Uh, those are so important factors that, uh, you know, keep us together um, that uh, it was it was pretty shocking for me in the past uh, couple of years that there was so little um, um, conversation around these um, technology mm -hmm. policy topics. And um, the previous administration here in the US was really more interested in um, keeping up in the arms race in AI, for example, um, uh, towards China. Um, and not um, not talking about uh, rules too much in order to not stifle innovation, which I, I think it's a double edged sword because in the end um, we I don't think anybody uh, at least uh, also in the tech companies wants to harm democracy, but there's too there was too little talk about um, what actually is do, uh, doing uh, this to, to democracy. And so this has changed. Um, the administration here has changed. And I think now there are really a lot of people in place um, and also here in California. I mean, California, it's so far away from Europe. <laughs> it's at the other end of the world, but um, there are a lot of um, uh, political uh, stances that are very similar. And I think that is better reflected now also Level. What hinders this, uh, the conversation is probably that both blocks are pretty much busy with themselves, not in general, also, but also just right now because of the economic impact of, um, of COVID-19 um, and also, you know, just um, democracy being more frail than we expected it to be, maybe naively. Um, and here in the US, um, uh, the, the whole tech ecosystem is so strong, but it's really more um, uh, looking at itself. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it's difficult to open up horizons, although people come from so many places in the world to work here. So mm -hmm. I, I work with a lot of people from around the world, they're not just, you know, Americans, but um, this is just such a complex ecosystem here that it's hard to open up uh, eyes about other places in the world. And in Europe, mm -hmm. I mean, this is now judging from afar, you can probably better um, explain that, but I have the impression that um, uh, on a European level, people are very busy coordinating between 27 member states and so many complexities and um, and uh, Europe is a very diverse continent. Um, maybe population wise <laughs> by far not as diverse as here, but just politically uh, so many different layers of uh, of policy making. And so um, 
I think it's interesting that in the case of GDPR, I had the impression that the the realization that this would have an impact on other places in the world came much later uh, than I expected because everybody was so busy figuring out how this would unify 27 countries. So I think it's, I mean, then of course there's legal cultures that are completely different, you know, um, code law and common law, um, that is a huge difference too, but I think it's mostly this, like the, the limited capacity of, um, you know, where to think uh, first yeah. and um, so both both are highly complex systems with different layers of policy making and then democracy is complicated, but it's the best system we've so far found. <laughs> no doubt there. And uh, I see we have a raised hand in the audience. Um, Raymond, you have a question. Yeah, this is me. Um, I was wondering um, before uh, you mentioned um, bias in AI systems. Um, I was wondering, can do you think bias can be overcome if you have large enough uh, training data sets uh, or do you need regulation on top of that? And is it sort of, um, well, on, that it can be avoided that there will be bias in the AI system, no matter how large the training data? Mm. Well, that depends also on your definition of bias, of course. Uh, and that is, I mean, as much as I would wish for a an international uh, framework on AI, when you can't even def define in our uh, system what uh, bias is, uh, what an intended bias is, what an unintended bias is, and what it, what fairness is, it's hard to completely uh, um, eliminate bias. But I think um, so. Again, <laughs> Esther, you liked my uh, example with uh, with. Um, with children, uh, raising children, but I, I mean, it's, I suspect it's just like when, when a small child, every time it goes to, uh, he or she goes to the doctor, sees a, uh, a white man in a white coat, and that's the doctor, um, it's hard to explain to, to that child when it sees a, a uh, non-white woman with a, with a colorful scarf that this is a doctor too. Um, and so um, this is unintended, it's just because the training data set is such. <laughs> um, and uh, we can do our best um, to, to make society and our other rules um, unbiased. Um, and, and we should do that. And then on top of that, AI has the potential to overcome uh some of those biases you know when you eliminate that um like old human brain that maybe thinks in a certain way that is not fair to you can set uh, the conditions yourself right you can create the environment the yeah yes that, that's that the ai learns from yeah exactly but the problem is just the scale so when you have one um weird AI HR boss uh, who doesn't like uh, women or <laughs> about, you know, recruitment in a certain way, that's, you know, one person. Uh, it's often hard to d change that person, <laughs> but at least the scale is pretty limited and you can point to the mistakes in many cases. When you have an AI system, it's a higher scale and it's a it's much more difficult to detect the the bias where it is. Um, but as I mentioned, it's you have to have a definition of what is fair and what isn't fair. If what you want to uh, achieve is fair in one society, it doesn't need to be f considered fair in another one. Um, and and so, I mean, every legal culture has their own rules. I'm, of course, uh, convinced that all humans are equal, no matter their gender, race or sexual orientation. But uh, somebody else could see that differently in, a, in another, another uh, legal system. Um, as I said, the problem with AI is that the uh, scale is so much uh, larger and that it's really opaque. Um, and I think one thing that would help already was if, the, if there was a system to improve uh, you know, the algorithm um, increasingly as, you know, the more mistakes uh, you see or unintended consequences, the more you can repair it. 
um, and then direct it in a way that you want it uh, to go. Um, that is really important, but that needs accountability and supervision. Thank you. I do have a follow up question for that. Um, you also mentioned that um, the, the second biggest problem worldwide you see now is that of regulation. Um, do you feel that uh, okay. innovation and technology will sort of outgrow, well, is faster and is developing way faster than regulation can keep up with? Well, um, of course, that, I mean, that's the case for um, all rule setting. Um, you needed the invention of the car to, you know, then come up with uh, safety belts and that took decades, you know. Um, in this case, um, uh, things go much faster and very often the people who, um, I mean, always in uh, nowadays, the people who decide about rules haven't, uh, about rules on technology, haven't grown up with that technology. So it's so recent that it's really hard to uh, decide about things that you haven't even used that much yourself. I mean, I don't want to say this is unique because lawmakers decide about many things they haven't used themselves, but then they have experts who write down things and um, and I don't want to say that tech is in any way special just because it's more complicated. It is, uh, it, it's an industry and products just the same and um, they shouldn't believe or the tech industry shouldn't believe that they're in any way exempt from, you know, rules. But um, I do think that um, the tech industry will get far more government attention in the next five or ten years uh, than it did in the last ten. And we're going to have lots of court cases, investigations about uh, different issues at this, you know, handful of companies that have this huge uh, impact right now. And um, we're also going to have a whole wave of new rules. Uh, probably tech isn't just being sued, uh, now it's being regulated. And that is complicated. It's always a trade off between many different desires. Um, you want to be affordable, you want to have good quality, you want to be safe, you want it to be easy to use. And policy making is, is of course, a compromise of all that um, and to see what works for most people. Um, and tech is in that way a bit special because um, uh, markets aren't separate. You know, in this case, uh, the network effects are global and um, uh, how do those, um, you know, those technologies follow local laws? Uh, it's almost impossible. And yeah, it's um, um, for the last 25 years, it's been mostly all uh, just, uh, you know, the US ideas of free speech and regulation and privacy law or none, <laughs> no privacy law um, competition, but because that's where the internet came from. And um, uh, also many thought that this isn't really important enough uh, to, to go to legislation, but that's clearly changed. And uh, so we're moving to a world of multiple overlapping regulatory spheres. And that's what I find really exciting as somebody who uh, thinks internationally yeah, I agree. It's a very exciting field to be working in right now. Thank you. Thank you for and that. Gianfranco. Oh, thanks, Esther. Uh, and thanks, Julia, for being with us today. Uh, I, I don't want to open a can of worms. You talk about many spheres of, of regulatory environments, and, and there is one we did not name much today, that is security. Mm -hmm. So it's perhaps the third leg of this stool of digital futures, together with data and AI. Uh, as, uh, a one minute answer from your perspective from the United States. Do you think uh, Europe is doing enough from your uh, uh, point of observation? And if uh, so, what would you like uh, uh, the US to learn from what you're doing in security as well? Uh, are you talking about information security of systems? Both sides are relevant probably to this conversation. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a huge field. We should have another, another session for that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm 
I'm in a bit of a dilemma, you know, whether market forces uh, or, you know, concern are are better and, and it de definitely depends on the individual case. Um, I, I do think that uh, both sides have uh, long overlooked this this risk and uh, there I mean like really a security risk for for people for society and um, and they're only just waking up in some uh, spheres um, but we need to have clear rules about uh, you know how much we can actually um, isolate ourselves or or how much market um, market powers should also have a uh, way in. Um, I'm not taking any side here, but I do think that what the what the you know the U US and European tech companies are, are working on and offering help to work on security systems um, and also in that way uh, creating a new field of uh, of of yeah, foreign and security affairs. Um, um, it's really important to um, involve them in this uh, and to uh, accept their uh, know-how and uh, to involve them also in the responsibility that comes with it. Um, because I think that those companies have long been overlooked as uh, important players, not only for the technology, but also for our values. Um, and I mean, a lot of those companies don't want to, um, you know, be identified with a certain political system. But when you um, when you actually ask them deeply, like, what kind of society do you want? I do think they would be ready to take stance and some of them are already. And then in that uh, sense, I think they should also have the responsibility to do their part to um, to protect the, the system um, that we cherish. And so um, I think we can't do it without the technology companies, but they really have to commit to that as well. Um, Thanks, Julia. Yeah, it's a bit topic, you're right. It's for next time. <laughs> so we will have you again. That's, that's solved already. Yeah. Um, are there more questions from the audience? Then I would like to wrap it up with one last question. We talked um, um, about, uh, you explained to us the concept of trustworthy AI. We talked about the impact of European regulation on US. Um, and maybe as a, um, as a last question, what can Europe learn from the US, from, from what you see over there? So, I'm now saying something that a lot of people say, but I I really see it on a daily basis when I work with companies here, also European uh, founders who come here um, because they want to realize some, you know, dream um, of a business plan or an idea they have. Um, it's a bit cliche, but it's really true that uh, people here take more risk in anything. Mm -hmm like even in daily life um, and uh, I'm, you know, I mean, I, I, I worked in public service. I'm kind of risk averse by nature. I'm, plus I'm from Germany, but it's impressive how, um, how much, uh, you know, um, people can just uh, be ready to, to try it out and, um, and, and not um, think only think about uh, pitfalls. Um, I mean, I my job here is, uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, to be the one who, uh, mm -hmm. you know, helps them to scan consequences and um, and find pitfalls before you tap into them. So definitely um, my niche is being between the worlds and, uh, and br uh, building bridges and, and helping mm -hmm. Um, those folks here uh, think about future risk a bit more, but I think it's that mix that is important. And what I see a lot in Europe is just, you know, constant reminding of what could go wrong and never trying. Um, and um, also to be all in when you try something um, and just give it a go. Um, uh, and I mean, this failure um, culture, I think that is something that is highly debated. I wouldn't even say that it's something that people strive for here. Uh, some 
pretend to because they failed, uh, but I don't think it's anybody's wish, um, but just take it as a potential outcome of uh, what you're doing and this this energy of just trying it out and and taking a risk um, and see. And then, of course, you know, um, I think that I bring some healthy Europeanness into the, the discourse mm -hmm. here by saying, are you sure this is what you want? Why don't you think about potential problems? But a healthy mix is probably what can achieve most. And in that sense, um, I think Europe, uh, Europe and the United States are just um, natural allies. Great. I think we can take this attitude maybe uh, forward for all of us. Thank you so much, Julia. It was great having you, super insightful, and I'm very happy that we already kind of scheduled you in for another talk. There seems to be much more to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you. And have a nice day. Have me. Great fun. Thank you so much, Julia. Thank you.